Good afternoon, everyone. Um, glad to see you all safe and in a place with appropriate power and that you were not too badly damaged by Montreal's worst natural disaster since I've been here. I'm also very pleased to see our speaker whose flight attempted to get delayed and then wasn't delayed by the weather conditions today. Uh, I'm Jacob Levy. I am the coordinator of the research group on constitutional studies. RGCS is a unit of the Yan P. Lin Center for the Study of Freedom and Global Orders in the Ancient and Modern Worlds. RGCS brings together students at all levels, postdocs, and faculty from across the university and especially from the departments of political science and philosophy and the faculty of law. People who study using a variety of methodological tools, the values, institutions, and principles that shape the fundamental governing structures of societies. This event is part of the research, on, research Group on Constitutional Studies lecture series. The RGCS lecture series brings leading researchers in those fields of inquiry from across the social sciences, law, and philosophy to McGill to present their research in progress in a way that is meant to be broadly accessible to a student audience aiming to overcome the traditional sharp boundary between the research community uh, that characterizes a research university and the experience of teaching and learning that characterizes student life. It is our experience that many of the very best researchers are also excellent teachers, and we ask them to come here and be both at the same time. This is the last event in this year's research group on constitutional studies lecture series, and I believe uh, nearly the last event on the Lynn Center's schedule for this year. Um, I have just in the last couple of days received word that for another year in a row, the grant that supports the RGCS lecture series, a grant from the Institute for Liberal Studies, has been renewed for next year, so we will be reconvening again in the fall. Um, as we begin, I wish to acknowledge that McGill University is on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anish Inabeg nations. We acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. And with that, I am very happy to introduce today Ryan Muldoon. Ryan Muldoon is an Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Buffalo. Previously, he was a Senior Research Fellow in the Philosophy, Politics, and Economics Program at the University of Pennsylvania. He was a core author of the 2015 World Development Report at the World Bank, and he's consulted with UNICEF and the UNFPA on norm diffusion and norm change. His work spans epistemology, philosophy of science, and political philosophy, he holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Pennsylvania, where he studied with and subsequently co-authored important work on norms with Christina Biccieri, the leading philosopher in the study of norms. He is the author of Social Contract Theory for a Diverse World, Beyond Tolerance, a copy of which we will, as usual, be giving away at the end of this lecture. Please join me in welcoming to McGill, Professor Ryan Muldoon. Thank you so much. Uh, so today, I'm going to uh, talk to you about some work that I've been doing, trying to think through uh, the consequences of an increasingly diverse uh, world and how we want to think about uh, justice in a, in a diverse and, and perhaps more uh, dynamic uh, environment. So I'm going to open up with uh, a, a bit on Rawls on baseball. So uh, Rawls wrote a, a letter in 1981 that was since uh, published in the Boston Review in 2008, uh, extolling the virtues of baseball as recalled from a conversation he had with, with Calvin. And one of the things that kind of struck me uh, in the virtues of baseball is he says, first, the rules of the game are in equilibrium. 
That is, from the start, the diamond was made just the right size, the pitcher's mound just the right distance from home plate, etc. And this makes possible the marvelous play, such as the, doubles, the double play, the physical layout of the game is perfectly adjusted to the human skills it is meant to display and to call into graceful exercise. So uh, later in the letter, he contrasts this against you know, the less good sports like basketball and, and football that are constantly adjusting their rules, uh, whereas baseball has been in this graceful equilibrium because it's just they've gotten it right to display the right kinds of skills that makes the game so rewarding to watch. The trouble is, baseball's rules have indeed changed quite a bit. So uh, not too long after uh, Rawls wrote that letter, there started being a phenomenon of newer baseball stadiums built to be a little bit smaller uh, to increase the rate of home runs. Uh, just this year, there have been two fairly large rule changes in baseball. So the, uh, the bases are now a few inches wider to make it easier to steal bases. Uh, and now there's a pitch clock because games were taking a really long time and the pitch clock has in fact sped up the game. So why these rule changes in this game that was supposed to be kind of an ideal equilibrium uh, with the dimensions of the, of the field and the rules and all of this? Well, uh, players got better. Uh, especially pitchers got substantially better. Uh, people can throw the ball a lot faster, a lot more consistently than they could 30 or 40 years ago. There's better training for that. Uh, but also, uh, a non-trivial part of this is in the last 15 or 20 years or so, uh, the, so, the sabermetrics revolution has changed the way that baseball managers construct their teams. So now instead of uh, your scouts relying on someone that's very good at you know, being a four-tool baseball player and things like this, they kind of assemble what they're looking for out of several players instead of trying to look for in just one player. And so this has revalued how people evaluate uh, baseball performance, team performance, what a good team looks like, and all of this. And all of these uh, changes, these you know, changes in, in training, these changes in uh, management techniques, were all within the rules. No one started cheating. Uh, but they figured out how to do better under those rules that had been fixed for a long time. And then we figured out eventually that, well, we are going to have to revise the rules in light of all the changes that the players have made to their behaviors under those rules. And so now we've revised the game, right? So we, we just we were out of equilibrium. And so uh, I think this is a nice little microcosm of the fact that with any given institution, people get experience with that institution. Technological changes give us uh, different abilities under the rules in those institutions. And what happens is we learn, and that knocks those uh, uh, institutions out of equilibrium. So just as Rawls is wrong on baseball, I think he might be wrong on justice as well for the same kind of reason. Uh, so, I'm not going to rehearse all of Rawls' argument here, but uh, the core idea and a lot of what occupies uh, Rawls' work, especially in theory of justice, but also in political liberalism, is the idea that once you've identified a theory, uh, uh, an account of justice, uh, what you want to do is you establish uh, institutions that will embody that sense of justice and then will stay in equilibrium in, in perpetuity. Right? We'll, we'll, once we've settled in on that account of justice. We'll all know that the institutions are in support of that. Uh, we'll feel good about everyone else doing the same. And so that, that holds us in place with a given account of justice. But uh, we should think that uh, a, a political order is a little bit more complicated than a baseball game. Uh, and so uh, the kinds of uh, things that are supposed to push us into equilibrium uh, are going to be harder to maintain in a political environment than, a, and than in, a, like in a baseball game. For example, uh, we're subject to even more kinds of churn. There's way more ways in which you know, technological advancements or uh, demographic shifts or things like that can affect what we're up to uh, in the rule following of those institutions that we've set up for ourselves. Uh, but further, uh, our social and political life uh, is constructed out of lots of 
these institutions and games, so to speak. And there's lots of different ways you could win uh, at those sorts of things. There are lots of different kinds of incentives that you're, uh, you're confronted with, such that you're gonna learn in different ways and adjust your behavior in more ways than in the fairly narrowly constrained version of what baseball can be up to. And I think this is just for the really simple reason that if you're uh, in the business of doing liberal political philosophy, liberal political theory, uh, when you have something like liberal pre uh, freedoms and a default permission structure that is kind of core to a liberal idea, uh, you're just gonna get a lot of this stuff uh, automatically. When you have freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of association, you're going to come up with new ideas, you're going to group up with people that want to talk about those ideas and promote them to others and think of new ways of doing things that uh, they view as in better than what we were up to before. And so uh, we can see a, a version of a Nozickian liberty upsets patterns sort of claim, but in much more broader terms, not just about distributive considerations, but just about how we go about thinking of the rules of life and the, the institutions that we, that we follow. So the basic challenge, pulling back again to just what we're up to in, in political philosophy, is we've got to pick rules for ourselves somehow. We've got to determine what, uh, what are the rules that we're going to hold each other to uh, because we want to be able to live together peaceably. We want to be able to get the fruits of cooperation. We want to be able to uh, you know, uh, enjoy life and not have to worry about politics necessarily. We can just focus on the things that we have reason to care about. But the trouble is, when we're trying to work out those rules for ourselves, we disagree about a lot of stuff, right? So what the rules should be, what's the best conception of justice, uh, what are the values that we want to embody in different institutional arrangements, whether that's in formal institutions or informal institutions like norms. And so a, a standard approach that I think is kind of wrong in the way that that analysis of baseball was wrong, is that uh, we try to abstract away from those disagreements until we get at the stuff that we agree about. And then we uh, identify some standard of justice that we want to endorse or justify. And then we argue why that's going to endure. That's going to be in equilibrium somehow, whether it's via institutions or, or via a shared conception of justice or, or whatever. I think that structure has to be wrong. And it's because of stuff that uh, theorists like Rawls have uh, done a really nice job of elucidating uh, in their own work. So we should expect that liberal orders will have lots of dis uh, disagreement and diversity of various kinds. And Rawls himself thought this was inevitable. This is part of the burdens of judgment where we can uh, uh, just have reasons to kind of bottom out at disagreements about uh, how we uh, value things, how we trade off between values, how we go about measuring things, our causal theory for what will promote one thing versus another, all that kind of stuff reasonable people can disagree about and it's not that someone's clearly wrong, it's just there are a lot of different ways you can go about trying to articulate uh, uh, particular things of value in a complex social order. So uh, there are kind of two strategies that uh, a lot of liberal theorists use uh, to try to deal with this amount of diversity. So they, they generally want to think about it. There's this, there's this level of disagreement in churn, but we're going to kind of keep it at bay in our theory in one way or another. So one way is via normalization strategies. So a normalization strategy is something like Rawls's veil of ignorance, right? So you imagine you're you but you've forgotten everything about yourself and all the characteristics that go into being you, but you're still going to make choices about what would be best for your life, even though you don't know anything about your life. Uh, so that's a way to collapse all the disagreement that might be present in this room down to a representative agent that can carry on a rational choice calculation to figure out what rule to endorse. Another sort of strategy, and we can see different levels of, of normalization across theorists, but everyone's doing something like that. We're abstracting away from stuff about ourselves until we reach a point where we're all, all citizens together somehow uh, that share core values that we can identify and build rules around. Another sort of strategy instead of normalization is what we might call containment. So containment is, well, there's 
there's going to be this, uh, this churn of, of disagreement and diversity, but the trick is uh, we're going to hold it at bay somehow. So I think a really nice example of that is uh, what James Madison argued for in Federalist 10, right? He says, well, there's a reason why we want to have a larger country rather than a smaller one, because we can't get rid of factions, and we don't want factions to dominate government. But if we have a small country, any given faction might become powerful enough that it can overwhelm the others and thus end up calling the shots. But if we have a really big country, we'll have a whole lot of different factions and they'll just kind of fight it out with each other. So uh, the kind of median opinion that falls out of all those factions is pretty good. Uh, and none, no one's able to dominate because the kind of the space of competition is just too big. And so we can, we can use factions against each other uh, to try to contain the power of faction. So both of these strategies are ways of trying to uh, constrain our concerns with diversity and disagreement. Either we've kind of imagined it away one way or another, or we've articulated a, a, a method institutionally uh, to, to kind of constrain damaging effects. So uh, in his last book, Jerry Gauss uh, argued for uh, this idea of autocatalytic diversity that I find extraordinarily compelling and I think is just, just correct. And the notion of autocatalytic diversity is just that diversity is going to beget more diversity. As you get more diverse, there's more ways of combining those diverse things together to get yet more diversity. And so we're going to have an unbounded amount uh, not something that's going to kind of stay at some fixed level. So here are like three different ways you can think about why something like autocatalytic diversity is just going to happen in a liberal order. So one is ver via what we might think of as recombination. So think of you know buying a Lego set, say, and there's lots of different kinds of pieces, and you can assemble the set in the way the instructions say. But think of all the different ways you could put together those pieces. It's a lot. The numbers get really large, extraordinarily fast. I'm not gonna even bother with the, the math for you. It gets ridiculous very quickly, even if you only have like three or four different block types. You can also think about what's going on with uh, ingredients for cooking, right? There's lots and lots and lots and lots of different ingredients for cooking. You can combine them in radically different ways. And indeed, what becomes an important ingredient, in fact, shifts with how many uh, ingredients go into a recipe. So there's really fascinating work on this, of like the kind of keystone ingredients shift when you go above like five ingredient recipes to like 15 ingredient recipes. They shift again when you go a little bigger. Uh, and it's because their value in relation to the other things that are involved uh, depends on the overall complexity of the thing that you're doing. In the same way the value of Lego pieces shifts how, depending on how complicated the thing that you're doing is. So that's, that's one kind of model. We can just recombine these basic elements in a bunch of ways. And the more elements we add, the more ways of recombination just skyrockets. Another sort of way of thinking about this, if you want to use it like an evolutionary lens, is you can think about either something like evolutionary radiation where just there's drift, right? There's, there's no particular pressure to be one way. And if there's no particular pressure, you start trying lots of things. So that, that gave us all of Darwin's finches, uh, combined with uh, something like niche construction, right? So not only do I find myself in an environment that uh, is subjecting me to some pressures, I can start altering my environment to make me better off. And when I start combining something like uh, niche construction with something like radiation, we get radically different things very quickly, even from a very similar starting point. Uh, just from this initial drift plus a reinforcement mechanism, me changing my environment to better suit the way that I am right now. So that's another way that we generate a whole lot of diversity as soon as we, as soon as we have a little bit. Another way we can think about this is just adding dimensionality. And by here, I mean like, as we come up with new ways of valuing or new things to value, we can add a, an extra dimension to our discussions on justice. Right? We, have, we have new sorts of things to worry about. It's not just you know, property rights, yay or nay, but it's that plus 
uh, how do we think about associations? Plus, how do we think about uh, inclusion while also having some notion of uh, you know, associational rights that are separate from uh, bare individual equality and all this sorts of stuff? This, each of these dimensions adds uh, more stuff to worry about. So if you read any kind of negotiations book in business, say, like getting to yes, like a core, uh, a core recommendation from all of that literature uh, is just add more things to the discussion. So if you're just fighting about salary, let's say, it's zero sum, right? Every dollar your employer gives you uh, is one less dollar they get to keep. But if you can add other things instead, like, uh, you know, uh, working from home or hours worked or flex time or whatever, all these other dimensions that we can value differently, it's easier to find some way that someone's going to say yes. And so in those sorts of cases, people have a pretty good incentive to up the dimensionality of what we're talking about. Because right? it's easier rather than harder to find a way to agree. And so again, just that basis of disagreement gives us reason to find new ways to, uh, to add new issues uh, to discuss. Because there's, it increases the space of possible agreements for us. So once we got that stuff going, once we have this uh, autocatalytic diversity going, we uh, find that uh, this shifts what Stuart Kaufman and, and Gauss took up. Uh, the uh, adjacent possible uh, shifts fairly dramatically. The stuff that we view as kind of a nearby possible world, like a, an institution that we could realize, or you know, a way of living that someone like us could do, and maybe we couldn't before, this adjacent possible expands. The set of uh, options that we have in our political and social life just expand. And as that expands, that's going to reinforce those earlier diversity dynamics, where we're going to have more ways of disagreeing about all those new things that we can do. So I think in light of this autocatalytic diversity kind of story, those normalization and containment strategies are just out the window. Uh, we're, uh, we're not in that kind of a world and we're, we can't kind of claw ourselves back into one. So instead we need to think about, well, how do we take advantage of this stuff instead of trying to suppress it? So, uh, in, in this work that I'm trying to develop, uh, I think uh, it's safer to conceive of diversity as a strength of a liberal order, where diversity and uh, disagreement are resources that liberal societies get to draw on rather than the problem that they have to deal with. Uh, and the, the core challenge is in finding ways of channeling disagreements and channeling diversity into productive ends instead of just zero-sum competition. So I think part of the answer uh, to this is taking advantage of those dynamics that generate that autocatalytic diversity. Namely, embracing diversity means you're embracing dynamism. Uh, if you try to go for embracing diversity and keeping stasis, then we're just in zero-sum competition everywhere, all the time. We're always fighting with each other, and we're, we're going to have more intractable disagreements. But if we're uh, uh, embracing something like dynamism, that means that we're in a position where we can benefit from changes and we can take advantage of the new things that we learn to figure out better ways of being with each other. And this is important because uh, I think I'm very often uh, political theorists especially, or political philosophers especially, forget that we're only so smart. Uh, we're epistemically quite limited. We don't know a lot about the world. We don't know a lot about ourselves. We don't know a lot about all the details of social science as it's still being developed, right? Uh, and so we have to be a little careful with what we're proposing. Uh, we have to figure out what we can actually figure out as our next step rather than what's the ideal at which we should aim. So uh, I want to try to take advantage of this in a, uh, in a framework to think about it. So we're we're going to lack a capacity to predict the kind of ideal state uh, because there's not going to be an ideal state. Uh, but instead, what we can do is take advantage of the fact that we can learn from each other. And the more uh, disagreement and diversity there is in the population, there's more space for social learning. So 
I think this requires a bit of a different model for theorizing about some of this stuff. I'm going to try to sketch that out in the rest of this talk. So I think there are kind of three core pieces uh, to a theory of this sort. So first, we've got to give up on equilibrium. Uh, we we uh, ought not imagine ourselves aiming towards some ideal stable state that we can get to if we just try hard enough. It's a mirage. Uh, and if we were to get there, we would change it. Instead, what we want to do is think about uh, how we set ourselves up institutionally in ways that improve our capacity for learning, uh, in, uh, improve our capacity for innovation, and uh, how do we make room for social experimentation. So trying out different social rules and institutional arrangements. But we have to bound this change somehow, right? We don't want to kind of spin off uh, in a bad direction accidentally. A liberal or open society needs to remain open and remain liberal through time. Right? We have reason to want to preserve some core features of liberalism that uh, have proven themselves valuable across a number of different circumstances. So we need to think about how to avoid a dynamic society kind of like getting locked into a corner and deciding, oh wait, we're good right here, let's stop. Uh, so we have to have some kind of constraints uh, on, on what this dynamism can do to us. And recognize that how we conceive of those constraints might in fact themselves adjust through time as we figure more stuff out and, and kind of the space of possibilities shifts. So what I want to do is art articulate kind of two big ways that this stuff can happen. And uh, I think there's a lot of space uh, for thinking about how you make trade-off be between these two different ways that would generate quite different sorts of accounts uh, in political theory. So I think uh, if we're looking to take advantage of, of uh, uh, dynamism and, uh, and diversity, there's it's kind of a top-down sort of a way of trying to do that, and there's sort of a bottom-up way of starting to do that. So the top-down uh, is kind of, uh, kind of at a structural uh, uh, level, uh, finding ways of uh, facilitating uh, experiments in living, uh, which I kind of uh, have taken from John Stuart Mill, uh, where we have kind of a top-down model of joint discovery, where we're kind of intentionally trying to test stuff out. Uh, and try to diffuse our conflicts. The other sort of bottom-up kind of approach is what I'm calling generative liberalism, where it's taking more advantage of kind of less intentional stuff, uh, where people living their lives uh, and being involved in uh, smaller associations figure pieces out and try uh, to adopt good ideas from each other and things like this. So things at that level might be you know, intentionally, uh, you know, living in an intentional community or just uh, living your life uh, and people observing that people who live that kind of life uh, end up having certain kinds of outcomes or something like this. So I'll start with the top down, then we'll talk a little bit about the bottom up. So, and this is articulated in my book, whoever the lucky winner is can find this out. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we can use social contract theory uh, and social, the mechanism of the social contract uh, that instead of trying to justify a particular ideal of justice, identifies the, the kind of uh, terms of engagement for uh, carrying out different social experiments uh, around things uh, that we just don't agree with each other about. So we can constrain this with whatever our uh, overlapping ideals are, something like a Rawlsian overlapping consensus. Uh, but that leaves a lot of room for us to try other stuff out in a systematic way. So this, will, uh, this is a, uh, a way of going that I think supports something that's more uh, uh, modular and polycentric in structure. So there's room for trying out different sets of rules that we can kind of evaluate on different uh, frameworks and, and see what we think of. And we can use that 
uh, modularity and polycentricity to kind of, kind of uh, constrain uh, the externalities of different experiments. So we don't want to kind of impose our will on others if what we're up to is precisely trying to work out what we disagree with about each other. Uh, we can use top-down experimentation to try to uh, uh, kind of diffuse conflict by just letting the various parties try things out. So I think this gives us a model of, of joint discovery. Uh, these agreements about kind of spaces of, of kind of, uh, you know, you can think of it as permissionless innovation or, or structured innovation uh, via agreement uh, allow us to search through the space of possible arrangements that adjacent possible that keeps getting bigger uh, uh, in a kind of better, more efficient uh, manner than we could if we were, be if we were kind of uh, forcing ourselves to a degree one thing. So diversity and disagreement on this uh, joint discovery model ends up benefiting us uh, enormously rather than burdening us because it gives us more ways of searching through this big space of possibilities. It gives us more opportunities uh, to find uh, good ideas or a new synthesis of things that might resolve our disputes. So uh, moral disagreement itself can facilitate uh, a more complete parallel search process uh, if we're th looking through different ways of organizing institutions. And diversity itself can help bring out greater social complexity that gives us kind of more richness in that search space and also the potential for discovery for better rules that kind of uh, getting to yes phenomenon of just adding dimensions until you find a broader space of agreement. So in this kind of top-down framework, what are the institutions that we're setting up trying to optimize? So in a, in a normal uh, social contract kind of view, what the institution should be doing is uh, kind of uh, manifesting and, and reinforcing our sense of justice. On this sort of approach, that's, that's kind of not what we're up to because justice is a moving target at best. And so instead, uh, what we want to be doing is uh, having our kind of primary big institutional arrangements structured around facilitating uh, our ability to engage in social learning. So kind of making rules that uh, allow for these kinds of experiments and innovations. Uh, so we want to favor institutional forms that foster new ideas, new values, new perspectives that kind of encourage an ethos perhaps of, of experimentation and uh, kind of uh, trying things out provisionally as opposed to imagining that uh, we're identifying something once and for all time. And so something that facilitates continual experiments in living. So now let's think about the kind of bottom up sort of approach. So if we're thinking through what autocatalytic diversity can do to uh, a pluralistic society is, well, it's, uh, uh, it's providing enough churn that we need to figure out some way of keeping ourselves kind of uh, identifiably coherent through time and justifying what our rules are through, through time to each other. So we need to have some process of, of justification, some way of saying like, yeah, I, I endorse this, or I, I don't object to this too much, or you know, some whatever your standard you want to have as being like these rules that bind me, uh, I have reason to accept. And so I think an interesting element of this is how we do that if we are imagining a society that is fairly dynamic, where institutions are evolving and rules are shifting and, and norms change through time. So a task for us too is figuring out how we can kind of make sense of the rules as, as uh, capturing something that does sort of persist through time such that we're an identifiable political unit that's uh, continued to exist. So here's what I want to try to capture uh, uh, in, this, in this kind of uh, generative model. So first, I think uh, it's a really important feature of liberalism uh, and liberal societies uh, through history uh, 
that we see lots of kind of institutional elements get reused in lots of different contexts. And indeed, this is how you know, theorists like Tocqueville talk about the importance of, of our civic lives, where they give us some structure to understand how the larger scale stuff works because we have smaller scale versions of it, of those institutional proce uh, processes and uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, structures that help us kind of get practice with the bigger stuff by, by working through the smaller stuff. But we can also imagine that we kind of use those smaller things as, as kind of test beds for new procedures or, or uh, 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 new ways of organization, new ways of combining different things uh, to see if we should kind of bubble those up. Another really important concept I think is, and this is true of liberal societies, but I think also uh, illiberal societies sometimes as well, where we have a lot of consistent concepts, like you know, the notion of justice has been around for a long time, the notion of equality uh, people have been talking about for a long time, uh, but what people mean when they say that word uh, has shifted a whole lot. Uh, we still, uh, we still think that we're in some sense talking about the same thing. Uh, but if we were to identify the elements of what it means to be free, and we start listing them out now, and uh, list them out in the 19th century or the 15th century or you know, uh, the first century, it's gonna be pretty darn different. But uh, I think this, you know, in one sense, as a you know, an analytic philosopher might say, this is a, a like a confused idea that the extension of the set has has uh, consistently changed through time, such that even the intention of the of the concept has shifted. But I think that's actually kind of a a good thing that we have this sort of uh, these consistent notions that we're we're adjusting to our purposes and uh, and refining as we learn stuff and and shifting around to make better sense of ourselves in comparison to uh, examples we know of in the past. So I think when you have those two things, we can imagine uh, institutional reincombination and, and kind of invention of, of new institutional arrangements uh, that we can still kind of introduce new stuff but link back to uh, what we might see as a persistent or common uh, political heritage or social heritage. And so this gives us some way of having constraints on like what might otherwise be a scary amount of churn. It also allows for people that are more conservatively minded uh, to see themselves as kind of participating in a persistent uh, uh, set of social structures, even if they are changing a fair bit, but we can identify the ways in which uh, they've stayed constant with some, with some values or, or uh, ideals. Uh, and so this gives us a way to kind of, you know, sort of retcon through back to the past uh, what it is that we've come to value about ourselves uh, in the present. So here's the, the slight wonky bit, uh, but I think it might be useful for, uh, for getting a couple pieces on the table. So if we're thinking about this emergent uh, generative liberalism that's, that's kind of this bottom-up process, we want to think about what are the relevant sort of bits and pieces that we have to play with that might kind of be contained within the box of that, that top-down stuff. So here we might think of, uh, kind of what are the, the basic Lego blocks of a liberal order, right? Uh, so we might have something like, uh, you know, simple uh, rights or rules or processes, things that kind of you can't break down anymore for them to be recognizably a, a kind of piece of an institution. And then those little simple pieces have sort of three elements, I think. So one would just be whatever its mechanism is, the thing that it does, uh, some kind of role description, uh, what it's, how we understand its function in an institutional setup. And then some kind of an interpretation. So uh, how we think of it fitting into a broader picture of, 
uh, in, uh, encouraging the sorts of values that we have reason to uh, hold or uh, maintain or facilitate the kind of society that we have reason to value. Then we have mid-level institutions that are kind of built up out of those bits. And then kind of resuscitating something with the Rawlsian basic structure that's built up out of those mid-level institutions uh, that's kind of uh, composed of a particular set of arrangements of those mid-level institutions that are themselves built out of those smaller pieces. And this gives us, I think, some uh, space to theorize about what we might call dynamic assembly of, of this kind of uh, uh, pieces of liberal institutions. So we can imagine that those core elements can be sort of remixed to make new institutions. We might think that small bore innovations are gonna happen uh, at uh, kind of local level uh, that will be uh, involved with switching out pieces or retiring different bits and pieces or changing them in light of a technological advance. And then we kind of reinterpret this new assembly uh, in light of what our, our shift in goals are, or just uh, our kind of maintaining our existing goals in light of uh, uh, the new procedural uh, practices that we've taken on. Then we can uh, see this kind of bubbling up to the higher level as well. So uh, institutions themselves may be substituted out for other entirely new institutions. Uh, that are serving some kind of similar functional role. We might decide that we just don't need that function anymore uh, and we get rid of it and that's gonna have ramifications for the other things uh, that are kind of with it embedded in a basic structure. And then uh, at each of these stages, we have to convince ourselves that we've uh, done the right thing. We have to justify why people should be bound to these new procedures uh, or why we're interpreting these procedures uh, in terms of supporting a value that might be kind of socially new in some sense, not something that we were uh, uh, publicly uh, worried about in the past. And so this, this dynamic assembly procedure involves at the end making sure that we have a justificatory process that allows us to say, yeah, I'm, I'm bound by these rules. Uh, these, uh, these institutions have some authority over me. So that dynamic justification, I think, uh, is a really, uh, I think, really fascinating kind of area to work on because if we're supposing that there's a lot of background uh, churn kind of in our, in our social life, in our civic life, in our political life, uh, and we don't have this kind of convenience of a, a fixed standard of justice that, we're, that we've been aiming at this whole time, how do, we, how do we justify to each other why we should make this change rather than that change? And so I think what we ought to do is rely on two sorts of constraints that are just changing at a different pace than some of the other stuff that we're worried about. So uh, first, members of society can judge by their own lights whether institutional changes are, are an improvement or not. And that's gonna go along with, you know, Lots of people change the things that they value through their life course. They've uh, come to decide that certain values are really important and others either just aren't or were in fact kind of wrong-headed in, in various kinds of ways. But we can always at any given uh, point in time say, no, I, I have reason to say this is, a, this is a good idea. This makes something better on the measuring stick that I'm using versus something else. And then there's this interpretation business again. So I think changes can be anchored in interpretations where we can not just say, I like this more than that. That feels like sort of bare preferences. Instead, we can think about, well, how does this fit into the, the kind of story we've told ourselves about ourselves, about this political community? What is it that we're up to? What is it that, uh, that's, con you know, what are our, our proudest moments and how do those feed into this institutional understanding, this, uh, this revision, does this make sense of who we take ourselves to, to be and who we've uh, come from? Or is this kind of totally alien to us? And it seems like we wanna make sure uh, 
that we can make sense of these changes in that kind of storytelling to ourselves. Uh, both to help have some kind of natural constraint on the way in which uh, all of this churn can, can unfold, but also so we can kind of make sense of what it is to be a, a political community still if, if so much is, is up for grabs. So uh, the, the goal uh, of this sort of framework is not to say uh, this is the right account of justice or what justice means is you know, handling diversity in such and such a way or something like that. Instead, this approach uh, is trying to suggest that uh, we don't get to try to identify an account of justice that's going to last forever. Uh, doing so kind of misses out on a lot of the stuff that I think is important about liberalism, the, the way it, it responds to challenge and the way it takes advantage of disagreements to foster new arrangements and the way in which it can uh, kind of process that that learning and, and shape it into something that uh, allows us all to do more of the things that we find valuable. And so uh, this, this kind of a process is meant to kind of elucidate something that I think uh, really does take place, but also gives us new theoretical grips on, on how to theorize uh, in a more uh, dynamic and, and changing world. All right, so thanks very much, I appreciate it. There's a microphone for questions in the center aisle. Uh, at the RDCS lecture series, the first question is reserved for a member of the RDCS Student Fellowship. So I'll call on the first question to enforce that, and then you can call sure. the subsequent ones. Uh, do you want me to use the microphone for the recording? Uh, yes. Yes. Really enjoyed your talk. And I was wondering if you might say more about the mechanisms that are necessary to facilitate disagreement. So here, the person I have in mind is Albert Hirschman, who, for instance, when he talks about firms, he talks about the centrality of both voice and exit as giving a place and space for people to disagree. And what is necessary in your mind to facilitate the space of disagreement for the diversity you aspire towards? Great question. So uh, I think there's two ways uh, to think about this sort of stuff. So the, that top-down business and the bottom-up stuff. So, the, so one way of, of going is, is very kind of uh, intentionally, namely uh, you have something like you know, uh, a constitutional convention that, that, say, that uh, figures out what the kind of uh, uh, the background constraints are and then uh, what are the, the burdens we're allowed to impose on each other with the different experiments we want to try out? And how do we go about kind of minimizing the costs on each other? And then we kind of, you can imagine something like we all get charters to try the thing that we want to try. Uh, and so you can make that, you know, or just, you know, different states, different territories get to try different things. Or you can have it as like within a more polycentric order where the water authority is trying this one thing. Uh, the parking people are trying something different uh, and, you know, the electricity company is trying some third thing and uh, then you and your neighbors are, are seeing if you can live off the grid because that sounds fun, you know, what, whatever it might be. So that you, you can imagine uh, a very explicit kind of legislative uh, kind of process uh, that's subject to some kind of like formal agreement uh, that would do that and then within those spheres uh, you could have different, uh, you know, uh, ways of exercising uh, uh, voice or exit. Uh, then the bottom-up sort of stuff is it's much more meant to be kind of a social evolutionary uh, sort of uh, story. So it doesn't have to be that you're kind of intending to experiment on X, Y, or Z, but instead uh, you're just living the life that you find valuable uh, with others who share that. Uh, uh, that kind of vision for life, and uh, maybe you find out it's not for you. And so, for sure, an important element of this is something like a 
a robust right of exit needs to be present. Uh, otherwise, you just have a lot of petty tyrannies. You have to make sure that people can uh, go somewhere, like someplace else, and that be like a realizable right, not just something on paper. Uh, but uh, beyond endorsing Hirschman, I'm not going to uh, say too much about that, just because I think there's lots of different ways that could uh, that can kind of play out. So you can imagine, you know, one group's doing some kind of direct democracy sort of thing. Another group is experiencing uh, experimenting with uh, you know, uh, we'll solve everything with an internal price mechanism and a, and a prediction market or something like that. And, you know, whatever else, right? There's lots of different ways that you could try that, but absolutely kind of crossing units, you want some robust right of exit to make sure that, you know, uh, uh, people's rights are being respected. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Hello. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. Um, so I'm going to pose something that I think to myself is maybe a problem for your view, but I either think I actually predict that it's just going to allow you to say more about it than I'm happy with either. So there's this old movie called The Wild One with Marlon Brando. The, he's wearing a leather jacket. It's the 50s or something. And they ride into a small town on motorcycles, and they're rebelling against everything. The, uh, somebody asks him, what are you rebelling against? And his answer is, what do you got? Right. My thought is that this character might be kind of a good person in such a society. Brings about new ideas. What he does is the turn thing. Problem is he wants something that you have in order to rebel against it. Right. So that's that might be a problem with that's where good ideas come from. Right. It's opposing something. Then one of the things that might be opposed in a society that's sold as look at what we do are. Our theory of justice is kind of ever receding, and we do this openness and whatever. The thing to oppose is that, right? The thing to oppose is this vision of it. What's wrong with the world that we've got this openness, mm -hmm. right? What do you what do you got? That's what you got. Now I'm going to propose. Let's you know have firm borders on this. So I'm just saying, like, yeah, yeah. I wonder if that such a person might be a really good one to have in your in in this kind of model, right? The guy who's just going to cause problems. The thing is that he, he might cause the problem of trying to undo the whatever. So I just wonder you know, if that's a problem or if the, I'm suspecting it's like right anyway. Yep. No, so uh, thanks for the question. That's, uh, uh, that's a good one. So uh, in an earlier paper in, in, in philosophy of science, I, uh, I look at you know, uh, uh, how labor gets divided amongst different scientists for uh, uh, coming up with better theories. And we look at, you know, like a control group of people versus what we call followers versus who we call mavericks, who's kind of like your wild one sort of person, where the, where the mavericks are up to, so they're the kind of rough theoretical ideas. We're all kind of uh, trying to climb an unknown landscape that has several different peaks. And collectively, we want to get to the best one, like the, you know, the best drug we could invent or whatever it might be. Um, and we're all trying to figure out how to do that. So the control group guys just engage in normal hill climbing algorithms. They're not paying attention to anybody else. They're just trying to go uphill. And if they're going downhill, they back up and they try to go uphill somewhere else. Because it's, imagine like you're trying to mountaineer at night without a flashlight or something like that. You're like, you take a step. If you're going uphill, great. Keep going. If not, you turn around and you try to go somewhere else. The follower strategy is sort of like, I'll go up, I'll take advantage of what everyone else has done as far as I can, I'll go up, uh, and then when I've uh, kind of maxed out that strategy, then I'll start exploring around where I got to that top. The Maverick strategy just says, OK, I can see where everyone else is going. I'm going to go away from that. Uh, and I'm going you know, to zig when everyone else is zagging. Turns out having some Mavericks in your population is fantastic. Uh, you get way, way, way better coverage of the, the epistemic landscape, uh, and you find stuff out way faster. Uh, but you might, so one is you might imagine that's an extraordinarily costly strategy for an individual. Right? It's really hard to live that kind of a lifestyle, especially if you're like a scientist. It's very expensive to just go crazy trying different things. Uh, that's not, you're, you're not going to get tenure with that strategy. Uh, but. Uh, having a handful of Mavericks makes uh, uh, everything else go a lot better. You point out, well, what happens if one of the things they're doing is uh, 
saying, oh man, we should just cut, cut off change. I like things now. I'm going to be like a, uh, uh, react against openness by being uh, hyper conservative or something like that. Like, let's, let's be done now. Uh, and yeah, I, I take that kind of person seriously. And so uh, in the written version of this, I, I uh, uh, talk more about uh, that kind of word, where I think that's just the, the fundamental tension of this sort of uh, environment is we might get to a point where some subset of the population is going to say, this looks like a good account of justice. Let's, let's turn off the learning and turn up the maximizing the justice, right? Uh, so uh, the specter of those sorts of people is why I have this reinterpretation stuff uh, in the account. Uh, there really is, I think it's not fair to design a theory around the assumption that people are super high openness to new experience, which some people just are not as just a, a fact of their psychology. Uh, or, and we might have these Marlon Brando's that are just deciding they want to, you know, have the open world burn instead of, uh, something else because the man is open or whatever. So there's, there's that. Uh, so the thing, the best I th think I can say on that front is one, uh, give a way of redescribing what's going on as, as not changing too much to at least handle the people that just aren't too open to new experiences. So we can kind of reinterpret what we're up to is just, uh, holding on to the values that we've, that we've had. Uh, but in terms of, uh, people taking what, uh, you know, uh, Gauss and some others called like the optimizing stance on a particular kind of justice and kind of turning off the learning. The best I can say is, well, we can put in constitutional constraints, but that's unsatisfying, right? Uh, I think uh, the better answer here, and this is definitely something that I want to develop more, and I'm glad that you kind of spotted this, is uh, you want some way of, uh, demonstrating the value of the openness. Uh, so people are convinced that this is a good thing, right? Not just that you're, uh, not that you're, you're just doing it because of the burdens of judgment or the burden of tolerance or something like that. You're doing it because, no, this is in fact making uh, your life better by your own lights. Yeah. Uh, and so like that's, that's the, the goose whose golden eggs you wanna preserve. Uh, but yeah, I think that's uh, a, a fair challenge. But a crazy case. I mean, somebody. Okay, thanks. You. Thanks. First of all, I'd like to join my voice to the choir and thank you for your talk. That was very interesting. Um, my questions have to do uh, with um, social epistemology, uh, which seems to be central to your work, and yet I feel that there's, there might be some tension between two different forms of, well, I'm calling it social epistemology, perhaps that's not exactly the right word, but two different uh, way of um, assessing how knowledge comes to be imbued in institutions, and, but also of assessing the value or the effectiveness of those institutions themselves. Um, I'm thinking especially about two different strands of liberalism that come to exemplify different uh, stands on social epistemology. So on the one hand, your arguments on tradition remind me of a more Hayekian tradition, almost Burkean tradition, to the extent that well, tradition itself and evolutionary processes are considered uh, to be useful guides into understanding what works in a society. And so here there's some skepticism towards the uh, experiment. Yep. This seems to be one of the strands of your argument, where the other one has to do with social experimentation, which I would see more aligned with uh, Dewey, for instance, and the pragmatists and the social realism, uh, social liberalism, sorry, that you could see in the uh, perhaps in the first half of the 20th century instead. And what I'm wondering is, is, could this be problematic to some extent to your argument, given that they rely on different epistemological bases? Um, and one problem that perhaps could come to mind, perhaps it's not, uh, it's not a very uh, compelling one, but still I think if we think that tradition, for instance, can guide us into not making too radical changes that would run the risk of 
um, I mean, that which could set off off, off path basically uh, and deviate too much from an open society. Uh, does this not also run the risk of obfuscating alternatives uh, that were eclipsed or that were not taking at a particular juncture in time? I'm thinking again of the social realism of Dewey, for instance, or, and of the pragmatists, uh, also of the progressive era, uh, that we seem to have that seem to have lost their place in the liberal tradition in comparison to the more market-oriented uh, liberalism that we see in, from the 1940s and 50s, on, 50s onwards. So I'd like to hear you a little bit more about this. Sure. Fantastic question. So uh, here's what I have in mind. So uh, the kind of bottom-up sort of uh, processes that we're identifying as kind of more Burkean or, or Hayekian. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to say that there are in fact all that, certainly not Burkean, for the, for the reason that uh, uh, this isn't, a, a, the bottom-up uh, stuff I was describing wasn't meant to say let's, uh, let's be careful with touching these rules because we don't know what we're, we're doing. Okay. Uh, but rather, when we mess with those rules, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we can do is redescribe the new rule in terms of the stuff that we had reason to value from the old ones. So it's, that's why I, was, I, I kind of offhandedly mentioned it was like a retconning kind of mm -hmm. thing. So a challenge with, with uh, like a Burkean conservatism, if you're assuming a, uh, a kind of dynamic world, is that you're going to get stuck on stuff that might have at one time have uh, have been uh, an optimal rule and however you want to describe optimality, but the ground shifted underneath you, so now it's really not an optimal rule, but you're convinced that it, the wisdom of the ancients point you, uh, points you to this rule and you're stuck there. I very much want to avoid that. Uh, and so the, the thought on, on that strand, the bottom-up stuff, is meant to be uh, 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 more along the line of uh, this doesn't have to be people intentionally exploring facets of justice. It can just be people living out their lives or trying new things in a space of, broadly speaking, permissionless innovation. Uh, but as we kind of like start using this, we like in uh, sort of like in the common law tradition where you kind of have lots of cases and then you start developing uh, heuristics that describe larger and larger sets of cases, we can say, oh, look, this, this thing we're doing, it's really like that thing we were always doing before. And it's, isn't it so similar? <coughs> right? Doesn't it hold, uh, help us with those same values? Whereas I agree, the, the, the top-down stuff, it looks much more kind of dewey and uh, intentionally so, uh, where it's, it's kind of, uh, we have the capacity to make these really big changes or try out these big things and we'll see how it goes, right? And then making room for this bottom-up stuff. So uh, one of the things I'm really intrigued by is kind of, I think those are the two, I think you're right to identify that these are kind of two ways of conceiving of liberal social epistemology in some sense. And so I think they're, they're kind of two poles, but there's lots of space in between about how do you make trade-offs between those two things. And so, uh, the, the reason why I started thinking this way is, so in my, uh, in my book, I'm, I'm pretty heavy on the top-down process side with kind of the, the local level stuff kind of feeding into the next round of the top-down process mm -hmm. stuff, where we're kind of intentionally debating after we've gathered all this new evidence of, of you know, smaller scale experiments in living. Uh, uh, Jerry Gauss's last book, The Open Society and Its Complexities, uh, really pushes hard against the top-down stuff and embraces a thoroughgoing Hayekian kind of model uh, uh, that tries to kind of avoid quietism, basically. So it's, it's a really you know, intriguing and, uh, and thoughtful piece of work. And so I was thinking, well, like, uh, if I imagine a pull from like, uh, me to Jerry, what's, like, what's all the space in the middle? And it seems like there's a whole lot of different kinds of ways of, of making trade-offs there. And that's, I think, a really exciting space to explore. And so that's part of what my project now is trying to do, think about all these ways that those two different modes of, of social learning can uh, play off of each other.
Can I ask a quick, very quick rejoinder? Okay, I was wondering then, what role does uh, our what role do our epistemic limitations play in this theory? Because, of course, from a more purely, so to speak, Hayekian perspective, uh, they would really limit our possibility of uh, experimentation. Whereas, from a Deweyan perspective, we would not really be as limited. Rather, as James would say, truth is uh, the cash value of an idea. So, how it works is whether uh, yeah. we should value it or not. So, to to which extent did this play in your theory and the oh, yeah so i so i think very much so the the players in either of these modes uh, of social learning are epistemically limited beings so a lot of those experiments on the top down stuff aren't going to work mm -hmm. okay right? we're, but the value of them and this gets back to something that you were mentioning earlier is they can knock us off a really terrible path dependent uh 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 uh, trajectory that we've gotten ourselves on if we're only doing that uh, that bottom up stuff where you know the the span of the adjacent possible from these existing things might be overly constraining you might imagine say something around like uh, you know uh, constraining gender norms you know uh, making it very hard to have like bigger shifts towards equality where a bigger kind of top down experiment might try to knock us off that and it might fail right uh, but it uh, but it has the potential for kind of uh, getting us out of out of bad equilibrium. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. This is great. Um, so, as a philosopher, I want to make a distinction and then ask a question. Um, it's not my distinction, right? It went in Rome, we're in Montreal, it's uh, borrowing from Jerry Cohen here. I think that we should distinguish between three things, right? First, what justice is, and two, what makes a state stable, and three, what we ought to all things considered do, right? So I had these three distinctions in my head and I was thinking, well, you're interested in the first thing, right? You're trying to provide an account of what justice is, right? Um, you said, well, instead of justifying a particular ideal of justice, let's have a contract that facilitates learning. So I took it that you're moving away from this particular ideal theory of justice to a non-ideal theory. And I was thinking, well, that just is a conception of justice where diversity is one of the values where we say, well, let's you know, try to minimize or maximize diversity and uh, we'll, we'll worry a little bit about minimizing brute option luck, or sorry, brute bad luck, right? Um, but then you said near the end of the talk, you said, uh, well, I'm not here providing an account of justice, right? So I was wondering, well, it sounds strange to view all of that as just providing an account of what we all things considered ought to do, right? It really does seem to bear the earmarks of theorizing about justice. So it's just a bit of a clarification question, getting clear on are we providing an account of justice, what we all things considered ought to do, or what makes a state stable? Or perhaps you might reject the sort of Cohenite distinction I've set up between those three things, right? Yeah. I suspect that could be there. So. Uh, yeah, more towards that last option. So let me, let me say a little bit about uh, why. So um, I definitely am not in the game of articulating an account of justice. Uh, I think uh, we're definitely going to fail at that. Uh, it also it presupposes that there's some fixed account of justice that remains across contexts and time and things like that. I think that's just obviously false. I've, I've written some stuff that goes beyond just saying that. But, uh, but yeah, I think that's, I think that's untenable. Uh, and so uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, and I'm trying to offer an alternative uh, approach where we don't highlight justification, justification of a particular account of justice as the thing we're up to. So, you know, Cohen, you know, says Rawls has this theory of stability, not really a theory of justice, blah, blah, blah. He wants to give us an account of justice. But what, uh, where I object with Cohen is he's articulating this thing that's uh, there for us to attain, but I, I think that's at best a mirage. Uh, what we could be up to instead in political philosophy, and this is maybe a better way of answering your question, uh, is not focusing ourselves on, on the question of justice and instead thinking about what are uh, the ways of having uh, rules that allow us to explore uh, what different conceptions of life or what, what uh, uh, possible improvements to uh, our own 
quirky accounts of justice might be. So it's you, uh, kind of the comparison I have in my head is like uh, the scientific method writ large, or like the institutions of, of scientific discovery, aren't themselves science. They're not themselves articulating the truth. We are very interested in thinking about how the institutions of science work to facilitate folks within them to generate stuff that's of value to us. And that's what I'm trying to uh, be up to uh, in the normative case. Cool. Love to chat more. But sure. Yeah, there. Thanks. Yeah. I did that. Uh, okay. So um, it seems to me to like an extent that this kind of model you're proposing does seem to be how things operate. Like people do have these contrasting ideas and they change institutions, but at least in this current context, it seems that a lot of the time it's changing and getting worse for a lot of like oppressed peoples. Um, and I guess I was just more wondering like, if your theory um, takes, like, if you have um, kind of like theories of power and oppression within this kind of account of diversity, because like diversity, big, um, and you know, somebody who maybe advocates for something that might further the oppression of women or something like that is, in their eyes, also a diverse opinion. And yeah, that seems like, I was just wondering what your thoughts were. Um. I do not have a theory of power whatsoever. Uh, at some point, it'd be good to try to think one, uh, about one, but other people can work on that, uh, <laughs> uh, on that too. I, I like division of the labor. Uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> so one thing is uh, that I think it really is important is you know uh, perhaps one day to the next at present, it, it kind of feels like institutions are getting worse and uh, less good for oppressed peoples. But if you like pull back a little bit, Mm -hmm. They're way better. Uh, it's, you know, uh, we're on a pretty good long run trajectory of being more equal and more inclusive in a lot of different dimensions in ways that happen on some of them really fast uh, compared to uh, other kinds of improvements. Uh, so I, uh, without diminishing the lots of stuff that's bad right now and seemingly getting worse. Uh, it's also, I think, good to not index too hard on the exact present moment when you want to think about what the broad, what the broader machinery is capable of doing. Uh, so, uh, given my you know, luxury of just being a philosopher, and not having to make particular policy changes on particular things at, uh, at uh, particular times. One of the things I do think is important about this way of conceiving of, of liberalism is that this sort of stuff uh, where people disagree and they're uh, trying to figure out how to you know, make a space for themselves in a political community and, and get recognition and all that kind of stuff, it's a lot easier to see how those sorts of concerns are straightforwardly represented in a theory uh, than I think ideal theorists who tend to just imagine ourselves in a uh, a community of everyone who has agreed on the final account of justice, which keeps shifting across books, uh, but uh, that we all, we all have reason to endorse and, and so on and so forth. This gives room for kind of uh, giving structure and, and normative uh, uh, oomph to uh, those very real and important uh, debates such that we can maybe figure out how to engage in them better uh, and things like that. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Um, I sort of have something similar to Michelle's question, or at least related, I think. Um, in terms of like the centrality of um, historically contingent um, identity formation, and I guess like, uh, so I don't know if I have the words, but like I guess a communal, um, like identity oriented around communal values uh, for like the bottom up approach. Um, I wonder if potentially there might be uh, I guess there might be a roadblock in that um, with 
historically and contemporary, con like contemporaneously, like right now, <laughs> um, uh, it seems like a lot of uh, people that are aligned with um, historically continuous uh, values, particularly in Canada, I think, where di diversity does seem to be um, a collective value in terms of the Canadian national identity. Um, policies that are sort of oriented around that uh, seem to undermine the value of diversity a little bit, or at least um, unintentionally perhaps, and intentionally sometimes, qualify or undercut the um, the political drive of diversity. And I'm thinking of things like the Indian Act. Um, might that be a potential problem? And in the more radical sense, like it's used, I think, frequently to justify like xenophobia and all of the bad all the isms. Bad yeah. Isms. Uh, that's a great question. I, I don't know what's in the uh, Indian Act, so I, I don't think I can comment on that at all and not make a fool of myself. So uh, I do think it's really important uh, in this kind of more open society uh, construct that you can have lots of different social identities. Uh, and social identity formation uh, uh, can take place such that new ones can pop up and old ones can merge and, and things like uh, that. So. I, uh, if you're interested, I can send you a, a paper that's coming out in a volume that is looking at social identity formation and segregation. And I think that's getting at some of this uh, kind of stuff, or it's always the first pass for me getting at some of this stuff. Uh, but yeah, I think there is an interesting challenge of not wanting to like reify social distinctions in ways that I think are remarkably, un it's just remarkably unhealthy to do it. Uh, uh, but also not kind of trivialize uh, social identities. And so uh, nothing I've said here today really kind of gives you uh, uh, a framework for trying to work any of that out. But I think frameworks that are compatible with what I'm talking about could be worked out. And I think a, that'd be a really fun project to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. We have closing pieces of business, uh, the first of which I'll ask for your help with, which will be. <laughs> 20 is Jordan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, some immediate and then some longer term pieces of business. Uh, when we adjourn, um, I'll invite you to stay for a reception at the back. People who are signed up for dinner, uh, we will head out. I think it's nice enough weather to head out on foot. It's about a 20 minute walk, uh, which means that we will have to be out the door at 6.40. Um, longer term. The next two things that are happening on RGS's schedule, um, one of them I want to mention even though it's not local, uh, April 20th to 29th, the next Junior Scholars Workshop in the Political Theory in and as Political Science Network will be taking place at Duke. Next year it rotates to NYU, the year after that it will rotate back to McGill. After that, the next RGCS event uh, that will be open to the students in the fellowship and the PhD. It will be on May 24th when, uh, along with the Group de Recherche and Interuniversitaire en Philosophie Politique, we'll have a manuscript workshop for Teresa Bejan's book, um, an overdue one because she was our RGCS Fulbright scholar in a COVID winter that meant that we couldn't properly do justice to her work while she was here. Those of you who are new to RGCS in the room, um, you will have heard me talk about the Student Fellowship. Um, the Student Fellowship is open to undergraduates, master's students, and law students. Its primary activity is a year-long weekly reading group. This year we have read uh, Tocqueville's Democracy in America, Frederick Douglass's My Bondage and Freedom, and Seneca's Letters on Ethics. 
The applications come open to the fellowship over the summer in uh, early to mid-August. If you are interested in making sure that you are notified when those applications become available, please go ahead and get in touch with me. I keep a running email list of people to whom I will distribute the application when it comes out, that we also try to get it out on broad lists. Um, and I'm jacob.levy at McGill, and you can get yourself on that list there. Um, particularly uh, if you're a current U2 or current U3, primarily in areas like political theory and political philosophy, but not strictly limited to any of those, um, then I hope to see applications from you in the, in the summer. As we, as we wrap up for the year, um, I want to thank everyone who contributed this year to the RGCS Student Fellowship. I want to particularly single out and thank our really excellent student leaders in the fundraising campaign, uh, who are Michelle Atkin and Alex Byrne. <laughs> who did a wonderful job in uh, keeping the momentum going toward eventually getting the fellowship fully funded. And with that, the lecture series adjourns for the year, the formal programming of the RGCS Student Fellowship adjourns for the year, and tonight's event ends. Please join me in thanking Professor Ryan Muldoon.